Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Bruce Buffington, your host of the show and president of Northwest Bicycle Safety Council. I would like to say hello to the viewers at CCTV down in Salem. We're coming to you live on February 17th in front of a live television audience, and I'm supposed to remember who all these people are out here, so let's give it a stab. We have with us tonight some members of the Coffee Clatch from Bethany Village in Beaverton. We also have some Beaverton Optimist Club members. We have some senior rollers from Northwest Bicycle Safety Council. And we have, who else do we have out here? Let me look around for a moment. Let me look around. We, we have a lot of glams out here. I got a little lost on that one. However, we do have a special lineup for you tonight. We have Ann Morrill is going to host the show, and Dan Kaufman is going to be the guest co-host. We're going to have Sergeant Malcolm Lewis from Oregon State Police in our event corner, and that's brought to you by Northwest Bicycle Safety Council. Also, we have a very special guest, Washington County Commissioner Dick Scouton, and he's going to have a very special presentation for us this evening. So, what do you say we take it away, Ann? Well, thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Yes, we are mixing it up a little bit this evening from what you might be used to. Um, here to my left is my co-host, Dan Kaufman, and we've got Dick Scouton on my right, who is yeah. our guest this evening. Thank you. And to add to our show, uh, Dick's going to share some slides from his visit to Amsterdam, and so we're going to see what goes on in a whole other country on the other side of the earth. And so let's start by talking to Dick about the kind of bicycling that he likes to do and just kind of lay some groundwork here. Dick, you are a bicyclist. What kind of bicycling do you like to do? Well, I really like all kinds of bicycling. I pretty much have used in the last, i say the last year in particular, I just ride all the time, uh, both for my commuting purposes and uh, on weekends I like going up to Ball Peep. And I like riding into town, into Portland as well, and the east side, Espanade, and so I like mixing it up. It's uh, pretty much my exclusive mode of transportation these days. And I leave my car at home. Oh, excellent. Well, it's good to have you here, Dick. Thank you. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the existing bicycle projects that you had a role in developing here in Washington County? Well, I would say the last couple of years I've been uh, working mostly on making sure that in the transportation pie that uh, the bicyclists get their fair share of that. Uh, and I've worked principally in the area of getting funding both for planning and construction of regional trails and especially here in Washington County, the Fano Creek Regional Trail and the West Side Trail. Well, let's get to the, to the meat of our show here. We've got some, a slide presentation, and let's talk about how you happened to go to Amsterdam and um, why you wanted to go in the first place. Well, in the last, uh, last year, I've been, uh, I've been uh, on the Blue Ribbon Committee. I was appointed, uh, there was about 15 of us on the Metro Blue Ribbon Committee. It's a mixture of elected people, business people, and people in the healthcare field. And we were asked to take a look at the regional transportation system and the trail system and uh, see what we'd want to do in terms of funding it and if we uh, want to push harder on funding, uh, what trails in particular would be on the top of our list. Because when we look at the, uh, at the regional transportation trails system that we have, at the rate that we've been funding them, uh, they won't be funded until 2198. So. So we, we had that to take care of, and uh, then I think about halfway through the six months that we met, we met off and on all through last year, we, uh, I think we took a turn in our work and we decided that in addition to funding regional trails, which we think should be funded at a much higher rate of speed so that we can enjoy more of them within our lifetime, but we also decided that bicycles are really a fundamental part of our whole transportation system, that they're really like cars and buses and transit, they really ought to be an integrated part of our transportation. And so w we uh, were able to go to Amsterdam and Copenhagen to see two cities in the world that probably best integrate bicycle facilities into, into their city. So that's what led us to, to make our, our trip to Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Okay. Well, and, and Amsterdam is when it is considered the bicycling capital uh, of Europe. And there are more bikes there than cars in some areas of the city. So do you really see, in, in looking at that, do you really see that happening in the Portland metro area? That is, that, that really 
our culture can t have more bikes than cars in some areas. Yeah, I think it's really a question of the kind of facilities that we have. If we, if we build some of the kinds of facilities that we saw in Amsterdam and Copenhagen, those that can fit our lifestyle in our city and the kind of uh, things that are, that, are, that are unique about Portland as distinct from a place like Amsterdam and Copenhagen, but we build some of the same kind of facilities, we can definitely increase the number of, uh, of uh, uh, folks who bicycle. Um, and actually, Portland in the Portland area, we already have about four or five percent of all of our, all the transportation that's done in this city, in this region, is by bicycle, which is very substantially more than what's typical in America. Across most American cities, it's about one percent. In uh, Amsterdam and Copenhagen, it's more like thirty-five or forty percent. And I think the key is is that a lot of polling has been done over the years. There's a lot of people out there who would ride but don't. They don't ride now in this country because they don't feel safe. And so when we went to Amsterdam and Copenhagen, we saw bicycle facilities built there that really make people feel safe beyond just that one or two percent of the hardcore bicyclists that we see typically in the U.S. So you created uh, a video presentation about your trip? That's right. There? Yes, absolutely. I, we have some slides to show or PowerPoint uh, pieces. I don't know at what point <laughs> we're going to get to those. But w what we're going to see is we're going to see some of the kinds of bike facilities that have enabled Amsterdam and Copenhagen to do anywhere from 35 to uh, 40 percent of, in fact, in the center part of Amsterdam, over 50 percent of all of the transportation is by bike. So, so we just saw a slide of a lot of cyclists. I think that's pretty typical of of Amsterdam. There's it's literally congested in some in some ways for bicyclists. Oh, there's a uh, that first picture is actually it's going to be a mixture of things. Both Denmark, uh, Copenhagen, and Amsterdam. This is what you call a cycle track. If you notice, the pedestrians is on the left hand side, fully separated from bicyclists. The bicyclists are center part of the picture, and then to their right you see the cars, and that's one of the key pieces to this in terms of safety and perceived safety is that there's a lot of separation between uh, foot traffic, pedestrians, bicyclists, and cars. And the thought, the general concept is, is that a car is a hard object and you don't want that getting very close to a bicyclist because a bicyclist, that's a soft object. And you want to keep bicyclists separated from pedestrians because the bicycle is riding a bike and that's a hard object in comparison next to a, a to a foot uh, uh, person, uh, uh, a ped. So you want to keep all of those separated in, in areas where there's any kind of traffic at all. And this is actually what you see there is one of the main streets in the heart of uh, Copenhagen, and you see that separation. We'll see more of that in other slides. Did you take that picture? Uh, other people did. <laughs> okay, well, I didn't uh, notice it had Dutch angles there. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> well, um, <coughs> this this idea of everybody riding bicycles in Amsterdam too ha is relatively new. I, th I think they've been riding bikes a lot more for more years than we have. But but really, hasn't it m caught on more in, in say the last ten years? And and why is that? Well, I would say it's come. It's it started a little earlier than that. But uh, certainly by the 1960s, that their their bike culture was starting to go into decline, uh, as it had been in this country. And I think one of the keys was in 1973 with the oil embargo and the oil crisis that occurred at that time, whereas that was a turning point in which America, for any number of reasons, did not turn. It was a turning point for the Netherlands and Denmark, and they took very seriously the warning that they had gotten there. And starting around the mid-'70s and on, uh, Amsterdam and Copenhagen in particular steadily spent a fair amount of dollars year in and year out for the last 25, 30 years now, clo actually closer to the to, to uh, 40 years building bike facilities. So you, you often hear that this is just part of the DNA of, the, of these European countries, these in, in particular, but what you're saying here is, is that actually, no, they took a, an actual focused uh, change. It was the, it was the, it was the, it was the facilities that, that, that made them riders. I don't think there's anything special or unique about the Dutch and Danes. Uh, they're just regular folks like, you know, like, uh, like we are. They just have had really excellent bike facilities. And you can see in the pictures, again, you see that separation in the bottom picture on the left, the peds, and then the middle part, the bicyclists, and then further to the right, again, the cars. And they're all fully separated. As between cars and bikes, you see there's a planter strip. 
Uh, this is actually uh, part of our trip to Amsterdam, Copenhagen. We're working in that one picture. We're working at the hotel afterwards oh. because our trip, our, our tr week trip, was a mixture of of uh, talking and learning uh, from the experts there and doing feel and doing actual homework and and analysis. And then we were out riding bicycles as well. So it was a mixture of both things. Uh, the the things that we learned in Amsterdam and Copenhagen, we kind of put down in a series of uh, principles. Principle one, as you see there. Bicycles are a practical tool. They, they're, they're, it's all about day-to-day uh, -day practical solutions to things, taking your kids around. So that's uh, the first slide really sort of denotes uh, a whole series of principles starting with practicality. I think our next uh, picture, if we have a chance to see that, uh, speaks of connectivity. Um, that top picture, uh, unlike is so often the case here, when we, when we run into a major road or a major um, geographic barrier, we're stuck uh, here, the trail stops in, in Denmark, <laughs> for example, and that, that's, that's one of the main channels of the Danish, uh, excuse me, of the Copenhagen Harbor, and they've got a special bike ped bridge to get us over. It, that's called connectivity. Uh, another, uh, and also that picture on the right hand, the far right, hi far right hand side is of a bike ped bridge in just outside of Amsterdam. It goes over a major shipping channel, the Amsterdam Rhine Canal. Again, we're not going to allow major roads or geographical barriers to stop uh, the trails from continuing on. Uh, uh, unlike like the Ross Island Bridge here? Right, or <laughs> like Hall Boulevard and south part of Beaverton, all uh -huh. of a sudden you're stuck at one end of the trail and you have no way of getting across safely. Uh, the other picture that we just saw a moment earlier, uh, also an important concept, which is to connect uh, transit to bicycles. Uh, and we're seeing more of that here in, in the Portland area because people will ride that awkward mile and a half to and from work in their homes to work, uh, to, or I should say to the transit station. The, transit, uh, the, the uh, transit will get you sort of the great bulk of the distance. So it's the, it's the max and the bike together that are much more powerful than they are uh, as one. Because all by yourself, a bicycle, you're probably not going to go more than a couple of miles Max will get you that, that distance, but it's the bike that gets you that awkward mile and a half from the platform to wherever you need to get to. Well, let's and they do a lot of that in, in Amsterdam and Copenhagen. They tie transit with bikes. And we kind of need to be educated on doing that ourselves, I think. Well, let's take a, a question here. Like, as Bruce said, we've got a live audience, and, and uh, Bruce has a, a question here from the peanut gallery. So, Bruce? What do you want to ask? Well, I finished grooming myself. I <laughs> guess you caught the back of my bald head. And I just remembered, you know, I have these senior moments when I don't remember things. I know who else is in the audience tonight, executive and advisory <laughs> board members from Northwest Bicycle Safety Council. Anyway, let's get to uh, my question. Well, you know, I noticed in those pictures, and so did our, uh, I don't want to call them peanut gallery, but our audience, we want to know why wasn't anyone wearing helmets? Well, um, they they typically wear helmets only if they're uh, on a uh, on a fast road bike, uh, because what you typically see most people riding a bike, they're commuting, they're on slower bicycles, uh, and the facilities are incredibly safe, and they don't feel any need to, to 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 wear a helmet, and they also feel that wearing a helmet would denote that there's something really dangerous and uh, unsafe. Uh, uh, type of activity that they're engaged in, and they don't want to create that kind of sense. That's the, that's the rationale that I hear. I'm not entirely convinced. I think another question that I was maybe anticipating is, is there anything that you saw there that you wouldn't maybe recommend? And I, I think there's certainly no harm in having uh, a bike helmet, even in the most safe uh, kind of facilities that you see in Amsterdam and Copenhagen. But that's the rationale anyway, is that th there's no reason for it, and it creates a certain uh, sense of unsafeness that they really don't like to um, feel or you know create, but when you see uh, someone riding high speeds on a road, on a on a road bike, uh, then you'll see them. Or and and small, very very small children, will, you'll see were wearing helmets as well. Now, when we interrupted for the for the peanut gallery question, there, Dick, you were talking to us about connectivity, and and I think that's something that. I'll, I know I need to get more experience with. I'm, I was raised, you know, you get in the car and you drive to wherever you want to go. So uh, in thinking about that, uh, it was explained to me that in Amsterdam and, and other communities, people have more than one bike um, 
and they would maybe have a bike, a, a commuter bike at home and ride to the train station and then they have another bike in the city that they use from the train to get to their job or something of that nature. Can you explain that? Yeah. Well, I think, I, I think that's, that's something that some people do uh, use. Uh, they have a pretty extensive uh, uh, rail system and it's not unusual for, for people to, uh, to ride a mile or two or three to the train station, uh, park it there, take the train to wherever they're going and then have a bike at the other end. Um, and in a way, that's a that's a more elaborate uh, variation of what we do when we when we uh, take uh, take our, our take our bike and then from there put it on a bus or put it on the on the max or leave it parked there. Uh, one of the things they they have there at the train station is they have pretty extensive and uh, very uh, good weatherproof kind of bike shelters. So um, so for example, in Amsterdam. Uh, at any given time at their main station, they have anywhere between 15 to 30,000 bicycles parked around uh, around the train system. So, in a way, it's not too different from what we do, except it's it's just that much more. Well, I mean, it, it would be difficult if you tried to put all those bikes on the train, because then you'd have a passenger <laughs> plus a bike. So right. it makes more sense to separate them. You know, one question I have going back to the separation of the bicycles and the bicycles from the pedestrians. I think you might get a lot of resistance in this country from cyclists, especially road cyclists, who feel that vehicular cycling is the way to go. Um, and, and I've often wondered if that concept of vehicular cycling, and, and is that something you're familiar with? Right that, right. that, you know, you ride on the road, you ride like a car. But I've often felt that I don't think it would get us past this 1% national mode share. How do you feel about it? Well, I think, I, think that's, I think that's really the... I think that's exactly it. I think you've you've hit it really on the on the head there, on this. Um, we we felt uh, our recommendations are based on what we saw in Amsterdam and Copenhagen because we think that's the way those kinds of facilities will in fact get us beyond the one percent or the two percent, the very marginal, very very small role that bicycles play, to really being an important player and being part of the whole range of possible solutions. Uh, our um, I've heard the, the phrase, there's no silver bullet, there's in fact silver buckshot. Any, there's all different kinds of modes, all of which will solve to some small piece uh, all, all of our uh, transportation needs. The fact is about half of all the trips that we make every day uh, by transport, uh, by car or whatever, are uh, no more than 20 minutes by bike. So there's actually a significant number of uh, trips that we can make uh, very comfortably on our bicycle because a 20-minute ride is a very doable is a very doable thing, but most people, um, older people, uh, young mothers with with children, um, there's just a lot of people out there who are not going to ride on a busy street, e even even a bike lane on a street like 185th or uh, Murray. It just it, we're not going to get beyond that one percent. So if we really want bicycles to play a, a really significant role, and, and they can, and they can solve lots of problems. Um, in the area of, of uh, greenhouse gases, in terms of dealing with obesity and so forth. But if we want them to do that, we, then we need to build the kind of facilities that we saw, I think, in Amsterdam and Copenhagen. So. Uh, another principle that, that we learned is the importance of safety. Um, they have separate facilities, as I say, for bikes, peds, and for cars. So uh, they have uh, separate uh, traffic signaling in, in at least the southern part of Amsterdam and Copenhagen for bicyclists as distinct traffic signals for cars. Uh, pretty prominent signs that let uh, car drivers know to be very careful in making right-hand turns uh, as bicyclists are, are going on. Um, both those uh, signs, one in Dutch and the other in, in Danish, uh, are, are letting car drivers know to be on the lookout for ongoing uh, and continuing uh, bike riders to their, uh, to their uh, right. Well, you might find a lot of resistance in this country to spend the kind of money that it would take to to build those kind of uh, to do that signage, for example, those street lights. Um, it seems like even to ask for the smallest bit of the pie, um, cyclists are often told, "Well, you know, gas taxes pay for the roads. You know, um, there's not enough money for this. You, you know, that's the kind of resistance you're going to run into in this country. How did Amsterdam get past that, and can we get past that here?" Well, I think I'll answer to say I think we can we should be able to get it we should be able to get past that point here because as a matter of fact 
I think Washington County is pretty typical of uh, the way we fund transportation across the country. In Washington County, less than a third of the of all the transportation facilities that we built are built with with gas tax. Uh, most of the roads uh, that that uh, we fund are funded by property taxes or are funded by uh, charges that we impose as condition for development. So between the property tax and system development charges and the kinds of things that we impose on development, uh, more than two-thirds of all of the, of, the, of the transportation roads facilities that we build are not with gas taxes. So we pay for them whether or not we have no cars or four or five cars, used cars or not. So from an equity standpoint, um, um, we all are paying for these facilities with our property taxes, so for those of us who don't uh, have cars or don't want to use them, um, there's equity in that. And um, and number two, um, what was the second part of your question? I'm sorry. I just well, I mean, just to follow up on that too, is I think it would actually help with traffic anyway, with with uh, vehicular traffic. Um, but um, yeah, but how did how did Amsterdam get beyond this resistance, and can we get beyond that here in this country? Um, well, I think one of the, one of the th ways, I think we see it as a series of steps. One is to do some demonstration projects, and, um, and that actually gets to the heart of this thing, actually, which is that uh, uh, the facilities for bikes are far less expensive than facilities for, um, uh, for cars. Uh, typically, a mile of four-lane uh, urban uh, arterials runs about $50 million a mile. We could buy and pay for a lot of bike and pet facilities for $50 million. The fact is it's a lot cheaper, these facilities are a lot cheaper uh, than uh, uh, facilities that are exclusively for cars. So once you show folks what can happen, then... It can be cost effective as a way to, to, uh, to increase the amount of exercise that our population clearly needs. Uh, we clearly have an obesity issue. We need to get people out and doing more things. Uh, this way you can work exercise into your, into your regular transportation schedule very easily without having to pay any fancy club fees. Um, it's um, uh, very pollution free. Uh, it, it creates great livability. I think one of the livability issues for Amsterdam and Copenhagen, they're, they're so great to live in, is that we have cut a lot, they have cut a lot of the noise, pollution and grime from their cities because uh, they've cut about half of the cars out. Well, let's take a, a little break here, gentlemen. We've got our event corner. Um, Bruce has arranged to have Sergeant Malcolm Lewis from the Oregon State Police join us this evening. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about his perception as a law enforcement officer and cyclists and cars and how they mix. So, uh, Sergeant Lewis, go ahead. Well, thank thank you. you. Good evening. My name is uh, Sergeant Malcolm Lewis. Uh, with the Oregon State Police, I'm assigned to the bank's work, work post in Washington County. Uh, I've been there for about six years now and in the area, in the Bethany area for the past 12 years. I've been a trooper for over 20 years, so I've had a chance to see a lot of things and, 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 and witness a lot of things and do a lot of things. Uh, during this time, I've also watched the population of Washington County double. And uh, with that doubling comes the problems between vehicles and cyclists. And so I was asked by the Northwest uh, Bicycle Safety Council to share my observations. And uh, <laughs> uh, and just uh, uh, for your information, my area of responsibility is uh, Highway 26, Highway 47, and Highway 6, primarily in Washington County. And these are also a lot of the roads that most of the cyclists use uh, outside of uh, Highway 26, even though I wish that all bicycles would use 26 as a shoulder. It's kind of a joke. <laughs> Didn't go too well, huh? All right. <laughs> that was kind of a joke. Uh, <laughs> I, I say that for a reason, though. Uh, we have some beautiful roads in Washington County. I don't think anyone can argue that. Uh, you have West Union Road that takes you all the way out to North Plains, and then you guys detour around it. And we have uh, Highway 47. Uh, we have Highway uh, 6. We have, I mean, we have beautiful areas for bike riding, but they're not all welcome for bicyclists and for a lot of different reasons. And, and I say it again, it's because of the shoulders. There's no shoulders for bicycles. And what happens is uh, you have vehicles stopping, some stopping, would like to stop, some don't stop. Uh, some will try to run you off the road because they don't like you on their area and they think you're a nuisance. And you also have uh, you know, those that try to do the right thing and then the bicyclists don't think you're doing the right thing and then you get flipped off. 
uh, there's a lot of that going on out there. Uh, a lot of anger between cyclists and bicycles for uh, silly reasons, for the most part, and a lot of it has, has to do with people having no patience. I think most bicyclists try to do the right thing, but there are times when the, uh, the cyclists in these rural areas with no shoulders and blind spots are, they don't drive single, I mean, they don't ride single file. I mean, and that's a problem when you're trying to pass three bicyclists that are stacked talking to each other because they don't hear you coming or they hear me, I have studs on my tires. So normally they get out of the way or I'll hit them with the blowhorn. So there, there's, there's ways to help myself, but I'm not a general, I mean, I'm not the general motoring public. And the general motoring public uh, has a tendency to get frustrated. And when you're uh, on these major rides, I mean, this is something that I think, uh, you know, a little uh, education would really help with that. Because uh, you, you, most of these roads are farm roads. I mean, there's barely enough uh, room on these roads for cars, uh, let alone uh, cars passing in both directions and bicycles passing in all directions. Eventually, somebody's going to meet in the middle. We've been real fortunate that hasn't been happening a lot. It's happened in the past. I think we've moved a long way away from that. And they're getting more patient, but you still have the few. I mean, that, that can still be a problem. Uh, a few things you need to be aware of as well. I mean, uh, seasonal issues. Uh, farming's about to start up again, so they'll be out there with the big rigs, and uh, they have the roads. They're their roads. I mean, we can't touch them. And if they want to go five miles an hour, they have to go five miles an hour, and you have to respect that. And they're hard to pass. They're really hard to pass on these little roads. They take up a lane and a half. In certain areas as well, you have the, no, I don't want to get into that. Okay, let's move on to uh, the blind spots. There's many, many blind spots out there. We have so many rolling roads in Washington County. I'm talking the, the county roads primarily, where there's blind spots, you know, and you're driving 55 miles an hour, you come over, come over a, 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 an incline or a decline, and there's a bicyclist there, and then there's a car coming in another direction. There's, there's danger issues. And you should be aware of that. Uh, one thing a lot of people aren't aware in Washington County is uh, we have quite a few daytime drunk drivers. And uh, a lot of people don't hear that because it's not something that, you know, it makes the news. I mean, but we, I, I think we've arrested as many daytime drivers, daytime drunk drivers, as we have nighttime drunk drivers. And that's pretty, uh, that's, that's a huge statistic that I don't think a lot of the cyclists think about when they're out there riding around. That there's issues out there. Another thing you need to consider as well is, uh, which is something that we've taken into consideration uh, when we're chasing cars. This is uh, when we get in a vehicle pursuit, a lot of the times these guys will get off the highway because they, they know we have help on the highway. So they'll get off the highway and they'll hit these secondary county roads and trying to lose us and they drive like nuts. And one of the things that we've, we're doing now or starting to do now is uh, when we see cyclists on the road, we terminate the pursuit. So we don't want to get you guys ran over. We don't want to run over a cyclist because it it, it's becoming more and more uh, a problem for us when we're in these high-speed pursuits because it's uh, putting people in danger. Uh, okay. Where am I at? Where am I at? Where am I at? Am I doing okay? Okay. All right. Uh, also, uh, a, a new development that's coming up, and I hope that one day we get legislation to help deal with this problem, and that is going to be cell phones and the text messaging. You know, and this is not for a Highway 26 or a Highway 47 or 6 where there's actually room maybe you can do some of these things, but these rural roads, I mean, uh, an observation I've been making probably over the last six months is uh, when I'm running radar, about 80% of the vehicles that, that are speeding are on cell phones. So they, don't, they, they have no idea how fast they're going and they're not paying attention to what they're doing. They're not multitasking or they can't multitask. And that's a huge number, 80% is a big number. And then you add texting to it. Then that means they're taking their eyes off the road and all of a sudden there could be a cyclist or there could be a pedestrian or it could be, I mean, it's, it's problematic. It's problematic. Okay. <laughs> uh, one, one, one last thing, I'll speak really fast. Road rage incidents, it's, it's imperative if, uh, if you're involved in a road rage, road rage incident is get as much information as you can on the vehicle or the person that's in, uh, in fault or whatever and uh, carry a cell phone and contact us as soon as you can so that we can try to apprehend that driver. Okay, uh, I'd like to thank you for having me and back to you, Ed. Okay, thank you very much, Sergeant Lewis. I think that, that was really interesting to hear somebody else's perception. A little frightening, I didn't really want to hear it, but <laughs> I hadn't thought about drunk drivers during the day. <laughs> well, I think again, I think it points out to the to the, to the uh, need to really separate out and provide more space for everybody. If we don't really have enough space to be safe, 
uh, it makes it tough. Uh, we're not going to be able to get a significant amount of uh, bike ridership. And I th we may also be losing some opportunities for tourism. One of the areas, there's about three areas that we're promoting for tourism in Washington County, amateur sports, wineries, uh, and nature. And bicycling is a great way to, uh, is a great way to, you know, to enjoy all those things. If we could pick out some key scenic uh, routes through our beautiful rural countryside, uh, but have facilities that kept them off of the roads and away from the cars, uh, they could enjoy themselves and, uh, and the cars could go about doing their business. Uh, and that's the way we could really increase the amount of tourism, increase the amount of ridership, uh, people could enjoy uh, themselves and, uh, and be a lot safer and feel a lot safer. And then, of course, that's, that goes back again to what we talked about earlier in town. It's that separation uh, that would really grow the ridership and really allow bicycles to do the things that it can do to, to be an important part of the, the whole mode share that we have. Now, I understand you did ride your bike while you were in Amsterdam and in oh, that yeah. area. Why don't you tell us about that so that you can kind of contrast what you experienced there to what, what we're hearing from from the police here. Well, w well, when we rode, uh, first of all, out in the countryside in the Netherlands, and I believe in, in Denmark as well, but I think it's particularly well developed in the Netherlands, there's an entire independent network of roads that are just for, for bikes. And by law, any town of more than 2,500 people has to be connected to this national bike road network. So once you're on this uh, system, you're on your own. You don't have to deal with anything other than other bike riders. And so it's a very safe feeling. And in town, you're on facilities where you're away from and separated from uh, pedestrians and cars. So I felt absolutely safe at all times. I was able to, to drive at all times or bike at all times, uh, both day and night, and uh, didn't have to uh, be concerned about, uh, 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 about my safety. Yeah, well, it, it seems that what Sergeant Lewis is telling us about here is that, you know, that these roads are almost not even viable roads except for maybe the very, very best of cyclists. Correct, right. And uh, how do we get to a place where we create not just a patchwork of trails here and there where, you know, people might be on a Sunday stroll, but actual bike roads, like you say, that are connecting communities and even towns together in a comprehensive fashion. Um, I is that even doable? You know? Well, it's, it, yes, uh, it's a question of funding. It's a question of, uh, we know how it has to be done uh, based on what we saw in places like Amsterdam and Copenhagen and in the, in the suburban and countryside around those two cities. The, the key is the money part, and I think there's any number of possible funding sources. Uh, a modest increase in, in bike uh, uh, and also sidewalk and pedestrian facilities would make a huge difference, and bit by bit we can work to where these two cities are, bearing in mind that they've been doing this for some 30 years, but additional dollars from our county property taxes, additional uh, transportation dollars from at the federal and state level, uh, all could um, uh, help uh, us bit by bit to, to build this kind of uh, structure for, uh, you know, for bicycles. It's going to take a while, but uh, we could start with maybe some key places. Um, certainly one place I thought of uh, very specifically in Beaverton is, is if we can connect a couple of our regional trails, like the Fano Creek Regional Trail, to the Beaverton Transit Center uh, through, uh, through Beaverton by way of Lombard. That would be a, one place to start. Uh, because that would connect a major bike facility, an off-road bike facility, through an existing grid of streets, uh, quieter streets in downtown Beaverton, and connect uh, f folks in a safe way, safe route to the transit center where there's a lot of bus and bike connections. Now, you you talked initially about some of the projects you've, well, it looks like we had we had a, a slide there. I kind of missed it, but you talked initially about some of the projects that, that you've worked on in Washington County. And um, I, I live in Vancouver, I live in Clark ca County, and, and Dan here lives in the inner city. So we kind of have ki a kind of a mix north mm -hmm. to south here, of different, different areas. But do you find that as you build these projects, maybe there's a little resistance by some of the community, but yet you find that as you build it, they come? It's uh, kind of like, you know, the field of dreams? Yeah, absolutely. And I, th and I think that as, th as these facilities are built, you grow the, the bike ridership uh, and you grow the constituency for it. Uh, people come to realize it isn't uh, uh, it's cost effective 
and uh, it can really uh, address those shorter trips. And as I said, I go back to some statistics I gave earlier, uh, a quarter of all the trips that we make on average are, are less than a 20 minute walk and half of all the trips we make are uh, 20 minutes or less by bike. So these kinds of shorter trips can really uh, be very easily done by foot or on, or on bike. And I think bit by bit as we start to uh, build these facilities, people will uh, think we'll come to appreciate it. Th that this slide we have now is uh, the Banks Vernonia Trail, uh, which is a very popular weekend uh, recreational trail. Uh, but we find, for example, on the Springwater Corridor in Portland, tremendous amount of ridership, not only on the weekends, but also as a commuter route. And we're starting to see that on the Fano Creek Regional Trail. Um, there's a picture of the Springwater Corridor. Uh, these are facilities that are used and very much appreciated. And uh, so I think we can slowly um, build up this network over time. Now, are you concerned at all about certain vested interests that might be threatened by the idea of putting more of the mode share towards bicycles, and by that I mean uh, folks like the automobile manufacturers, the petroleum industry that have strong lobbyists. I, I don't know if you've noticed recently, but we've had congressional leaders like Boehner and, um, and uh, let's see, who's the other, DeMent in the Senate, who are actually speaking out against bike paths. I mean, they're specifically targeting that, saying stimulus bill money should not go to bicyclists. And you've kind of got to wonder, if you look at their campaign contributors, you know, the, the oil industry, the automotive industry, um, they have a vested interest in not seeing bicycles on the road. I, I, I never thought that we were that powerful of an influence at this point, but I'm starting to wonder. Well, I really don't think that bicyclists and pedestrians in any way threatens uh, the oil. It's going to bring the oil industry to its knees. Uh, 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 hi highly we doubtful. <laughs> <laughs> highly <laughs> doubtful. And then I don't really see it as an. I don't see it as an or. It's, e it's either one or the other. Mm -hmm. I think. I think both facilities and both kinds of. And when you go to the Netherlands or Denmark, you'll see a very extensive freeway system. You see a rail system. I see. You see a whole network of bike roads. Y you see it all. You see barge traffic. It's a whole mix of things. I think the problem we've had in our country is we. we it's the old thing in the toolbox. If y if you use a hammer and a nail for everything. It isn't particularly effective, and we have used, uh, we have tried to 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 put all of our uh, all of our tr transportation tools, and well, we kind of reduce them down to one thing, which is the hammer and nail of cars. Uh, they all have their they all have their role to play, and at least at this time within the Congress, um, uh, people like uh, Congressman uh, David Oberstar of Wisconsin, and even our, here locally, uh, Congressman Earl Blumenauer are in very powerful positions right now. They're very strongly. Uh, um, uh, supporters of, of bike facilities. So at this point in time, I actually feel pretty confident that we can get, get those kinds of dollars on the federal side. Right, but when you see billions of dollars going towards the uh, automotive bailout and people having to scrap and fight for every last million dollars for a bicycle and pedestrian facilities, it kind of makes you wonder a little, at least for me. Right. Well, I'm, I'm going to be going to the National Bike Summit uh, in D.C. and I'm going to be lobbying for, for uh, bike money when I'm there, and I know I'll be joined by lots of other people, be people coming from all over the country to do this kind of lobbying work. I, I'm more confident every day that, uh, that the logic uh, and, uh, and the success we've already seen here locally, particularly I think right in the city of Portland, uh, is pointing us in new directions. And of course, we're all trying to figure out how we can be less dependent on oil, how we can have cleaner air, how we can reduce uh, the, the growing tide of obesity that we have. And the bicycle can play in a very useful role in solving all those problems. Well, it looks like we're ready to take another question here. Bruce has got another question for you, Dick. Go ahead, Bruce. Well, what we would like to know is, you know, we noticed that bicycles and pedestrians are separated in congested areas. And so um, why doesn't that happen here? Um, well, you know, the, the, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that we've really fully understood that important concept. Uh, at least I have to say that I didn't until I went to, uh, to Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Uh, part of it has been the funding. I mean, we, uh, you know, in the, in, the, in the slice of transportation that's been spent for bicycles, it's been very, very minuscule. I would argue that just a very modest increase could really begin to, 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 to pay for these facilities. And um, more and more, I anticipate that that's going to happen, uh, both in this region and across the country. It's a question of money and spending just a little bit more money to get great results. 
So I think this is a very cost-effective kind of, uh, of, a, of a form of transportation that we can do a lot. We get a lot of bang for our buck by spending a modest amount uh, for bike facilities, including these separated kind of facilities that we saw in Amsterdam and Copenhagen. Uh, it seems like Amsterdam or uh, is the place, uh, I know when we were having the right hook problems here in Portland, it was kind of, well, what does Amsterdam do about this kind of problem? So it's really the, the, the go-to place right now. And you talked about one thing that you wouldn't like to see come here is the lack of helmets. Is there anything else that they're doing over there that you really, that didn't endear itself to you, that you really wouldn't oh, want to implement here? That's about the only thing I can think really? of, actually. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Just helmets, all right. Yeah, I noticed it going back to the question about separating um, separating the bicycles from the pedestrians, it almost seems like when you're a pedestrian and a bicycle goes by you fast, it's kind of that same feeling you get as a bicycle sure, absolutely. So a car mm -hmm. goes, right, right. goes by. And it's the same thing when you're riding a bike. The pedestrian is unpredictable. You know, they can run out in front of you. And it, right. it seems like you could... It, 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 you know, if you go back to bo before the East Blank Esplanade was put put together, people said, well, that was just going to be a hobo highway. I remember hearing on the Lars Larson show <laughs> at one point that only hobos <laughs> would use that. Um, and we've since to find out that actually it's used tremendously, especially when the weather's good, as a recreational facility, but also as a transportation facility. And now we find that Yes, you have people walking along, they've got their kids, and you got somebody who wants to go to work, and then you've also got a guy who's out on his, uh, you know, 40-mile ride, he wants to go 15, 20 miles an hour, and it's the mode share there doesn't fit very well, and it seems like mm -hmm. if they'd taken a little bit of time and thought about this, was it just the fact that they didn't understand how successful it was going to be? Um, was that what prevented that well, from happening? Well, what, what I have heard from uh, several people in the city of Portland, and I'm thinking now specifically of Roger Geller, who's the head of their bike uh, bike division at the Portland Department of Transportation, they have consistently underestimated the amount of uh, bike ridership they get from, from facilities. So we're still learning how to do this, but uh, um, it actually goes to the argument that uh, this is cost effective, this is worth doing, and we have found that the, uh, that the ridership is actually uh, greater than we've uh, ever forecast. Uh, but I don't want to overemphasize just that separation piece. I think it's a whole series of principles, as I had mentioned earlier, that led uh, to, to, to the success in Amsterdam and Copenhagen, and actually also the success of Portland, because Portland really is noticeably has a uh, much higher mode share of transportation for bicycles than is typical of American cities. And it's a combination of that separation, but it's also making sure that we have good connectivity, that uh, we span uh, difficult uh, geographical uh, barriers, whether it be rivers or whatever, or major arterials, that we don't um, leave people uh, on the edge of something where they can continue on. So trails and bike facilities of length. Traffic calming. Uh, that connect, traffic calming, a sense of safety, having that connection uh, between uh, bicycles and, and, uh, and transit and rail. Uh, all those things are all things that, um, uh, that help make uh, very successful bike program. So if you took the, the East Bank Esplanade situation, as Dan was explaining, uh, in Amsterdam then, would all the cyclists, because they're not wearing helmets, they're riding more slowly, everybody's more predictable, would you say? Uh, there isn't such a mix, a uh, diverse mix of different types of cyclists, so it's not quite so scary? Yeah, yeah the uh, traffic is very predictable, and uh, the, the traffic flow in Amsterdam and Copenhagen is very predictable. Um, as a pedestrian, you're not supposed to linger very long, if at all, on the on the, on the <laughs> bike part of the those cycle track facilities we saw earlier. If you're standing there daydreaming for a moment or two, people will begin to ring their bike bells or let you know in no uncertain terms that you need to move out of there. That's not your spot. You should be in the sidewalk, you know, pedestrian area, and uh, and and get out of the bicycle area. It's it's it's, it's the same thing. Like if you were to, as a pedestrian, were just to be standing in the middle of the car traffic, uh, that isn't going to work. People are going to let you know that that's inappropriate, and that's what happens there. So everyone knows what the rules are. Um, for example, one of the ways that they make it very obvious that, uh, let's say, an area is set aside for bicycle is typically in the Netherlands, uh, the um, surface is colored red, 
and in Denmark is blue, but it's the same concept. It's a way of very quickly letting you know visually that this is in a bike only facility. Some of the videos that I watched, like you're saying, there's the separation of the pedestrians and bikes and the autos. So the bus pulls up and, and the people unload into the bike lane. So, you know, you really have to be observant because the bikes are coming and you've got to watch and make sure you don't get run over while you're stepping off the bus. Now, you're speaking here in Portland or? No, I'm sorry, in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam. Or uh, it might have been Copenhagen, I'm sorry. Uh, didn't, didn't really see that in, okay. in, in Amsterdam. They, they, uh, I saw trams and I saw, uh, uh, I saw their light rail system typically had its own separate track area as well. Uh, kind of the way that we have separated uh, in downtown Portland max from car traffic with a raised surface and different surface treatment and bumps and so forth to keep people off. They typically do that with, uh, with the trams. And um, I believe that the, 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 the bus stops are set up in a way that when people get off and on them, that they're not anywhere near where the bikes are. Uh -huh. Now, are there any metrics that uh, cities like Copenhagen and Amsterdam have that can kind of rationalize the expenditures that they make? I mean, are they less dependent on foreign oil, for example? Um, you mentioned earlier they have less crime and pollution in their cities. I mean, do they have actual um, statist you know, data that, that can be looked at to, to back these things up? Well, um, bearing in mind that, at, uh, that the Netherlands and uh, Denmark are, are very modern, um, first world countries in Northwestern Europe that um, um, have all the amenities and enjoy a very high standard of living, but they only use about a quarter per capita of the gasoline that we use in our country. So they're far less uh, uh, gasoline used, uh, you know, intensive in, in their use, and yet they have a very high standard of living, and it's very much a, a modern society, first world, uh, you know, standard of life. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, and I, I mean, I've heard that a lot of times to, to, to make these things happen, though, you really have to do things like count the number of bicycles that are using a facility or, or um, you, you know, statistical data really helps uh, make these things happen. I don't, maybe they didn't need to do that so much. Maybe it was more of a theoretical thing over there. Well, I know they do, uh, they, they, they do have counters. They have electronic counters. They, they use uh, rubber hoses and they have various techniques that they use. Uh, to uh, to help determine uh, what the traffic is like and whether or not particular facilities uh, are, are working and uh, whether they need improvements. So they definitely they they definitely their engineers use measurement tools to help uh, shape their their capital improvement program and put together a list of new projects they want to build. Dick, I, I, one of the things that uh, I read about is that the bicyclists have to take a, a bike safety test, and I know that. Bruce through Northwest Bicycle Safety Council is always pushing bicycle safety. Do you see in the future that as bicyclists we'll need to take a test perhaps similar to what we need to uh, for, for driving or whatever they do over there? Well, again, like just to, to use again the example of what we saw in Amsterdam and, and in Copenhagen, uh, in both those countries, the Netherlands and Denmark, they uh, do have uh, bicycle training as part of, their, so like part of their physical education programs. And uh, periodically in the uh, uh, first uh, years of grammar school and in the, in the first part of the middle school, they uh, do uh, uh, you know, conduct uh, classes and programs and instructions and, and do have the kids take tests to, to, to see how they're progressing in their, uh, in their bike skills. Um, I think we need to do that here. We we've actually have lost, uh, We've lost a generation or two in terms of bicycle riding. We've lost some of that. Uh, we can't assume that people know how to do it. We've kind of, that culture has withered to some degree. Um, so if we want to uh, encourage more b bike ridership uh, for any number of reasons, uh, we need to, number one, build the facilities, and number two, we need to also provide a certain amount of uh, encouragement and training uh, and at, the, at the school levels. Uh, which uh, what they do with those countries as well. Interestingly enough, they also we met a woman in the Netherlands who um, um, uh, teaches uh, immigrants who are from other countries uh, uh, who don't come from a, from a bike culture to uh, to learn how to ride a bicycle. Um, this woman actually very specifically teaches uh, Muslim women 
uh, how to get comfortable in riding a bicycle because again that's not been part of the culture from some of the countries that these uh, women are coming from thinking of Morocco and uh, Turkey and so forth because they do want to engender that that culture all through the entire population both uh, newcomers and longtime residents of the countries sure so it's important to continue that and to not take for granted that there will be uh, the, the skills and the bike culture out there well, and that kind of brings to mind that some of the pictures that of, we think of bicycling, or at least I do, you have the fancy bike and you have the fancy bicycle clothes, but that's not at all what they do. They're riding uh, the, the clunker bikes and they're riding in their daily clothes, their business clothes, um, or whatever whatever else they might wear. It's totally different. Well, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, if, you, um, if you ride your bicycle a lot, uh, you will typically maybe have a couple of bicycles for different purposes. Um, for commuting purposes, you probably want uh, something that uh, is less likely to be stolen. Uh, at least this is a, a problem in Amsterdam, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you want fenders, you want the kind of things that really um, that protect you uh, from the weather and elements. Um, and you don't need a, something that's really a high speed bike, but you need kind of a heavy duty city kind of a you know uh, type of a bike a commuter bike uh, some of those same folks though on weekends they might go riding out into the countryside and they might be riding they might be riding a very expensive um, high-tech kind of road bike so it's, it's just a mixture of things depending on the circumstances um, do you think we can we can grow especially as adults like you're saying I think that the BTA the bicycle transportation Alliance does have some classes for kids like safe trips to school and things like that um, trying to get a new generation into cycling, but boy, educating adults, and I include myself in that, into less reliance on the car and more on bicycles and, and incorporating this into our lives, um, and they make it look so simple. You just have a clunker bike and some, you just wear what you're wearing. It doesn't involve all this expenditure and all this extra gear. It's just, you know, a, a little tweak to your existence. Do you think we can educate adults? Oh, absolutely. That. I think it's just a mixture of it's a mixture of spending a little more money on some key bike facilities to start with to build a success. We've seen that in the city of Portland. They're ready dramatically. Uh, they are they are ready. The city has a dramatically higher percentage of uh, of uh, people riding bicycles, something like five or six, seven percent of all the transportation in um, the city of Portland is uh, is on bike, which is a magnitude of four or five times what is typical of an American city, and the only difference is that they just have built more facilities that uh, that uh, you know that provide that kind of good, safe bike experience. So, I think it, it'll sell itself once we begin to build these facilities. Well, and on that note of building facilities, what as a as a commissioner here in Washington County, are you much involved with what's going on with the Columbia River crossing, the 4.2 billion dollar? expenditure to create a 12-lane bridge from here to Vancouver and probably increase sprawl. I mean, what's your opinion on that? Do you have any say on that? Well, I don't, uh, I don't have too much of a say on, I mean, that's something outside of my immediate uh, uh, jurisdiction. Um, those are decisions that, that are going to be made by the city of Portland and Clark County and so forth. But the fact that that's so expensive, just think of the incredible amount of bike facilities that we could build uh, for uh, four billion dollars, it boggles the mind. We we don't need actually. I think uh, somewhere in the, in the neighborhood of three four hundred million dollars would buy us incredible amount of bike facilities that would dramatically increase um, the uh, uh, the amount of bike ridership and could all could, could help us all save quite a bit in our budget. I I have saved an awful lot of money this past year leaving my car in in the driveway for great lengths of time. It's been great. Yet it seems the solution most people see to our congestion problems is to build more freeways. That's well, I think we're kind of I think we're going in some new directions, uh, uh, both regionally and I think uh, I, I think uh, nationally as well. Uh, we are going to be going in new directions because uh, gas is continues to go up. Uh, we're, we're we're more and more sort of realizing that it it's like as I said earlier about the hammer and the nails. Uh, cars are very useful in some contexts, but it isn't going to solve all of our problems. We're beginning to realize that uh, there's a limit to what the, the car can do and how, how expensive that can be and what we can't really afford to answer 
all of our problems with something that can't solve all of our problems. Well, Dick, just briefly, we're running out of time, but briefly, what would you ask your constituents here in Washington County to do on, on kind of a grassroots level to kind of get the ball rolling a little bit in moving more towards bicycle-oriented culture? Well, there, there's going to be a, a three or four fronts that, uh, that I'm going to be working on. One is, is to increase uh, the, um, the amount of money that we, that we um, uh, use on our property taxes uh, for bike facilities so that we spend maybe seven, eight, nine percent of, of those monies for bike facilities as opposed to the current one percent or two percent. Uh, maybe to start with, I would urge that uh, people um, give me, uh, uh, send me an email and I'll be happy to provide them with more information and follow up on that question. Uh, Dick underscore scout and that's co dot washington dot or dot us. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. That was a very good presentation. Dan, you did a good job as the co-host. And Ann, you. you're going you're gonna to be back uh, for the rest of the year, and we know yeah. we're going to see Dan again. Good. Dick, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. I'd like to yeah. thank our other guest, Sergeant Malcolm Lewis, for his uh, five-minute uh, event corner. One thing I think could solve a lot of problems is if you get this <laughs> book, it's free for bicyclists. It's called the Bicyclist Manual. You get it at the uh, ODOT, or you can pick it up at some of the DMV satellite offices around Oregon. And if you can't find one, <laughs> go to www.nwbicyclesafetycouncil.org. I'll send you one. If you haven't read the Motor Vehicle Book, get it, the manual. It's free. There's bicycle law in here, too. If you haven't read in a long time, then you're guessing. The laws, some laws have changed. You have the basic laws in there that, that really don't change much but then you can get yourself set up for some of the new laws. And some parting words. Well, I think we had a really good time this evening, and I really appreciated having Dan as my co-host this evening. And oh, Dick, it's you. always a pleasure. I know that yeah, uh, Dick has worked with uh, the Bicycle Safety Program for many years, and he was there when Northwest Bicycle Safety Council first started, and we do yeah. appreciate your continued support. Look for bike rides. There are safe places to ride. You can look at pwtc.com uh, uh, for some rides. Look at uh, Northwest Bicycle Safety Council. Also, there's some event rides. Pioneer Century's coming up this year. And the Tualatin Hills Park Foundation Metric Century. So we will see you out there. Remember, you are responsible for your own safety. <laughs>